I want to welcome and thank you for joining us today, both live and in video replay. I'm Anne Chaptel from Canada. Master Dyer Kensho Dekar is live from Bhutan with his family. Thank you to our treasure caretaker training team of monastic and community treasure caretakers, our board members, and our paid and volunteer staff. Thank you to the Buddhist teachers, nuns, monks, community, artists, and scholars who have graciously allowed me to interview them since 1970. Thank you to Master Dyer, Kencho Dekar, and his family for their hospitality today. Thank you to our funders, so many individual donors. Thank you for believing in us. And to our foundation and major donors, including Pema Chodin Foundation, Kensei Foundation, Shelley and Donald Rubin Foundation, Shambhala Trust, Oracle Corporation, Henry Ming Shen, Anne Thomas Donaghy, thank you, Terence Tai, and many, many more. Thank you, everybody. We offer this unique event to you for free. There are costs associated with putting these events on, and any support to continue our in person preservation workshops in monasteries and support to help us make our free online preservation resource available in multiple languages will be greatly appreciated. You can find the link to donate on our website, Treasures Resource, and in the chat. Any amount helps, $1, $5 each would cover the cost of this Zoom, and the $25 donation would go so far in continuing this preservation work please consider joining our team with your own expertise and your enthusiasm. I first met Kencha Dekar in Bhutan in 2012 when I documented his dying process. Kencha Dekar grew up in a family of traditional dyers and weavers and has a great understanding of the science behind dye processes and the need for sustainability. Hencho wrote the illustrated book, Traditional Dyeing in Bhutan. This book has been given to all schools in Bhutan and is available for you to order. He teaches about natural dyeing plant sources and processes. Hey, we're organizing special tours to Bhutan to spend time in his garden and his studio. Please let us know if you are interested. We begin now with a short video of Kensho walking with you from his home to his garden and sharing the plants used for traditional dyeing, sharing his studio, imparting some of his immense knowledge during the short time we have together today. And we will see traditional weaving done in Bhutan on a traditional hand loom. Then, we return to Kencho's home where he is waiting to discuss traditional dyeing with you and looking forward to answering your questions. Please raise your virtual hand then. Should your question not be seen today, please send it to us at treasurecaretaker at icloud.com. Now to our daylight video as it is dark in Bhutan now. Please enjoy and see you soon. Oh, 
Hi everyone, good morning. This is the place where I stay, and uh, hereafter I'll be walking off to uh, the forest area where I do collect my raw materials for dyeing. My walnut tree, uh, which I have planted myself, and this is wild walnut tree. So, so today I'll be taking the raw material as a uh, walnut leaves. Uh, since we do not have that much time to do the entire process of dyeing, so I'll just show you the sample. How do I collect my materials for the dyeing purpose? So, instead of uh, cutting down the old branches, so if you want to do the dying with the leaves so you have to plug in this form so that uh, it won't damage damage the branches and it won't affect the bring of the walnut fruits And uh, while plucking out the leaves and branches, uh, as like other fruit plants, fruit trees and all, it, uh, it seems like uh, doing pruning, thinning of uh, trees. So we have to pluck the leaves in this form so that it won't affect affect the, the growth of the fruits and the nutrition food uh, nutrition which the fruits absorb from the other branches So this is a bamboo plant, so I, this is also my plantation, so this bamboo especially I'm using for uh, dyeing for, for blue color, especially with the mixture of indigo and for that reason I have cultivated, uh, I have uh, planted these uh, bamboo plants. So this is Chinese hibiscus rose and uh, during the uh, summer season and or all during the season I use uh, leaves for the dying purposes and during the off season uh, when the leaves they shed their when plant plant they shed their leaves then I do use this stem and I never allow them to grow ever from this uh, height and whenever it grows up I just uh, do it pruning and all and keep it uh, as it is uh, uh, let plants to uh, grow much more bigger branches this is dogwood tree and with these leaves it gives different color in bark with bark it gives different colors uh, with leaves it gives a uh, silver color and with bark it gives again different color it will depend upon the modern which we use this is peach uh, tree and i use only the leaves not the bark because i don't want to destroy the, uh, the fruits for fruits for the next season so instead i'm using just the leaves with these leaves Directly color will be greenish or so if you change the modern it will give a uh, light brown uh, This is apricot plant and with this to get yellowish color uh, without any uh, Without using any moderns and uh, Same like uh, peach plant here also I'm using only the leaves not the bark and all This is the place uh, where I do my dying work. 
So instead of uh, using electricity, electric stove, gas and all, I don't use that uh, stuff. In fact, I'm using the natural one, which our uh, forefather had been using uh, in our country as well as in other countries also, especially I'm using firewood for the dye purposes. So we have to do since uh, I bought uh, walnut leaves, uh, especially with this walnut leaf, uh, I get it a brown color, brown color with walnut leaves. So the leaves uh, has to be <clears throat> kept in water. So after uh, soaking it in, uh, after putting it in the pot, we have to suck it. We have to d uh, dip it in in inside so that the, the uh, leaves they, they, we, they, we shouldn't allow leaves to come up above the water level so instead we have to just uh, put them try to put them uh, beneath the pot this is my indigo indigo solution and uh, indigo has to be done through fermentation process only and to do fermentation and all the, uh, the fermentation has to be done in this earthen pot only it won't work on other pot or other utensils it, uh, it should be the earthen pot only. We have to keep indigo in this earthen pot for years and years in order to get the blue color easily, fastly. This is the place where I keep my raw materials, uh, especially like uh, uh, lac, indigo, which are cultivated and uh, harvested once a year by the villagers in the eastern part of the Bhutan. So I collect from them uh, or I buy from them and stock up here and the upper uh, part, <coughs> upper apartment is my showroom for the finished product after dyeing, weaving and the final product comes here and I just keep it here in this showroom. So these are the sample of uh, raw materials which I have been using for almost for 22 years. and. Uh, uh, those are the mat uh, raw materials which uh, my father had been using from 1970s since he started the dyeing project in eastern Bhutan. And those are the raw materials and this thing which are here in this um, bamboo basket are the moderns which are used, used for the uh, used as a catalyst to change the colors. Once the dyeing process and everything is completed, that's how we have to uh, spin it. And uh, I don't know when it was uh, discovered here in Bhutan uh, to spin up, spin the yarns using this kind of uh, procedure. And this is how we have to spin once uh, the dyeing process and dyeing process is completed. After spinning. So that's how we have to make a ball uh, before it, it, it is loomed around. Once the looming is completed, spinning is completed, looming is completed, then it comes to the final thing, the weaving. That's how we put this weave uh, with using our own hand, not using the machineries and all, as like the other country they do it. So welcome to the final product or the showroom where we where I keep my finished product after tying, <coughs> looming, spinning and weaving. So I do keep here.
Thank you. And uh, those are all, those are the silk yarn, uh, which are all organic dyed one. Uh, this is yak wool and uh, it has been woven woven up by the high altitude uh, people but uh, the dyeing and all i did it from here especially the maroon the orange and the red uh, so i tried uh, my thing uh, best uh, to dye up with indigo uh, i thought to add blue color here but uh, since uh, i don't know why the indigo doesn't works with the yak wool so instead of using blue i just applied uh, maroon and orange red so still the research is going on why indigo doesn't works with uh, yak wool and the indigo it works special uh, perfectly with the uh, silk yarn so i'm on my way doing my research why it doesn't why indigo doesn't works with the uh, yak wool once I get my research result, definitely I'll do a video short uh, footage and then uh, show you show it to you all. Uh, this is the product of uh, nettle plant which we get in the forest, and uh, there are also collecting of nettle plant have different uh, process, but uh, the dyeing process is same as uh, like other colors and all so for example so if i give you the the color which i have used here and by the way this is uh, almost woven 20 years before and uh, the color uh, which i have used here are maroon maroon and black and the the the, the brown one which we can see is a white part out here is the color of the nettle plant In this piece so I'll just uh, give you the materials which I have used and the raw material which I have used for the dyeing purposes actually the back full background uh, which seems to be like a greenish it's entirely the vivernum plant and when it comes in the patterns I have used different raw materials this is out of uh, dogwood this is out of dogwood this is out of uh, lac this is out of uh, walnut leaves this is out of walnut walnut shell and this is out of lac and this is out of uh, walnut bark so that's uh, around four different types of raw materials has been used to develop uh, this piece of uh, kira especially worn by the women in Bhutan uh, final leg it, it reaches to me in this form before that Cultivation, harvesting and everything is done in eastern part of uh, Bhutan by the villagers. I have few groups of people who are cultivating lac for me, uh, lac, they are cultivating lac for me, indigo and madder. And those three, three raw materials are the main raw materials which are being harvested, cultivated. And others, we get it plenty in the forest. But especially uh, coming to the lac and indigo, the numbers of cultivator year by year it's decreasing. So, the, the main reason why I have started my research on the preservation of lac is because of uh, the number of uh, cultivator de decreasing yearly. So, in my research, it's not that my research is going to regenerate and uh, without any uh, investing any energy efforts in it, it won't regenerate. Uh, I'm not using it for that purpose, just as an alternative uh, for the preservation of lac. For that reason only, I have uh, started that research. Due to the lack of funding, the villagers, those who are cultivating lac, indigo, they are losing hope year by year because the number of uh, buyers in the market, of uh, numbers of buyers in the market keeps on decreasing year by year. By year. Uh, so, I alone cannot uh, absorb the entire uh, lag and indigo uh, to stock up in my place because I too do not have uh, fun from others uh, to in order to preserve and in order to keep this uh, dying culture for another generation. This is the old lag 
which I have uh, preserved, preserved it instead of uh, throwing away. Normally, after harvesting, harvesting and after keeping it for two years or more than two years, then it becomes useless and it doesn't work uh, work for the dyeing. So instead of using for dyeing purpose, we just throw it away throw it away but uh, this time uh, the, uh, with this lag I didn't throw it away instead I, I thought that I'll do some research on it and then I started to uh, preserve it collect it and then uh, done the research process and I think most probably this is 10 years old lag uh, this is how I do my research work and those are the lag which I have kept in and uh, if you can make it out the difference between the color of uh, the old stock and the uh, research where I have uh, where the regeneration is taking place here uh, we can make it out from the color itself that now the old lag seems to be a bit darker in color and the, the new one the regeneration or the refreshness has uh, turned this color to the uh, fresh one uh, this is the lag which I have uh, done research on it and uh, this is the outcome or the regeneration of old leg uh, old leg which has uh, which uh, i have preserved for 10 years back and after 10 years back i did the research and this is the outcome of a uh, new generation with old leg so this is the end of the uh, the procedure uh, which i had uh, shown before <clears throat> that uh, how I collect my raw materials and then how I uh, boil it and how I dye it and how I <clears throat> spin it how it's been woven and then how it has uh, reached at the uh, finish uh, at the in the showroom as a finished product and uh, by, at the end of the thing I would like to present you all that this is a book uh, named as a traditional dyeing in Bhutan, uh, it was uh, I had written this book in 2018, and uh, I had distributed the, the book in around the schools in Bhut here in Bhutan, as well as I have a future plan to distribute around the world those who are much more interested in the organic dyeing. So, with this I would like to present this book traditional dining in Bhutan so if you are interested do let me know and have a nice time thank you so much I am sure you all have plenty of questions for our master dyer and Please raise your virtual hand, and I'd be delighted to call on you. He'll answer your questions directly. Okay, I want to ask Kencho, um, what kind of challenges does he face um, in his day-to-day -day dying? And are there any ways, you know, easy ways that not normal people like us could sponsor? Hello. Yeah, thank you very much for the question. Uh, actually, uh, the Bhutan is such a place that uh, it's uh, mostly things are covered with the mountain and all. And uh, we have uh, in four direction, east, west, north, and south. So at present, I'm staying in west and the materials, especially the indigo, the madder, and the lag are cultivated in Eastern Bhutan. And to move from west to east, it takes around two days by car, and uh, it takes around 35 minutes by flight. So <clears throat> yes, I do face a problem uh, while especially, yeah, the direct, the, the direct answer is that the funding and all, because uh, I'm alone, uh, doing this dying work here in Bhutan and I had been doing from a very young age when I was a boy when I was a school student and uh, till now I had been doing continuously without keeping any breaks and all 
by uh, so whenever i do whenever i'm in need of some amount of money and all i do the dying work die and sell it in the market on some amount and that with that money i do move from west to east in order to uh, moralize the villagers those who are contributing for me right okay so mainly you could do with possibly some help to, to use the plane rather than the car, so it doesn't take so long. Yes, it is. Yeah, I see. Mm. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Raise your virtual hand to ask a question. Rochelle. Rochelle Whitehorn, thank you. Much for that presentation. I've never lacked LAC before. I was just wondering what that was. Did you hear me? I am listening. Well, you were showing that you were cultivating LAC, L-A-C. What is that? Oh, that's not uh, the cultivate. That's not the cultivating of LAC. The LAC has been cultivated in eastern part of the Bhutan. So at present, I'm in the west. So when the LAC <laughs> But uh, my yes. question is, is lack, is lack a plant? Is it something that grows? No, it's a secretion of insect. And uh, normally it is harvested once a year. Okay, never heard of that before. Thank you. Welcome. Lisa. It's uh, um, about the lac. How, what's the process for separating the shellac from the dye product? Uh, it, it has to be once the harvested lac reaches to me. So again, I have to display them keeping on that uh, bamboo mat or any bamboo, bamboo materials. So I have to keep them, keep them exposed in sun for two to three days after reaching to me. So once after, if, uh, after keeping it on in the sun for two to three days, so I have to pound it, boil it, take it out the residue, filter it, take it out the residue and use that uh, the, the liquid one. That's how I segregate the lac. And is the, the shellac used also? Do you preserve the varnish, yeah, the, the, the shellac? Yeah, the, the preserved one is the old leg. The leg is harvested once a year. Once it is harvested and when it reaches to me, that I can use for the dying purposes only for one to two years. Within that year, I have to finish up the uh, product, if not, it becomes useless and it doesn't work with the dyeing. It's not that it's not working uh, uh, for the dyeing, it works, but later, after six to seven months, it becomes light fastness and water fastness. If we use that old leg. So previously, I used to throw it away thinking it is of no use. So later in somewhere between in 2013 and 14, I started uh, to uh, do some sort of research, research and where I saw that uh, if I keep preserve that uh, the old product leg instead of throwing away and keep it somewhere else, mix up with some other leaves and all, then it starts to regenerate, regenerate or the rejuvenation. Sarah has a question. Hello, Sarah. Hi, yeah, thank you very much for the presentation. Really enjoyed that. Um, I was just wondering what mordants are you using and, and do you prefer to use particular ones with um, particular plant dyes? As to the mordant, I'm using uh, those uh, fruits which are sour in taste. 
and uh, with particular plant, I'm not using a particular model. In fact, I'm just mixing up a different kind of model. Example, uh, a lemon. Uh, some amount of lemon I extract from extract from lemon, make it into liquid form, and then an, another, uh, say, a monkey apple. I just extract from them, mix up the two uh, modern together, and use with uh, one raw material. Example: If I use a uh, uh, peach leaf as a raw material, then I'm using lemon and a monkey apple mixture as a modern. So that's also in order to have a uh, long duration lasting of the colors. And it, 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 at, the, uh, at the end, it, become, it doesn't become light fastness and water fastness. Otherwise, whatsoever raw material we use, just get a white uh, yarn, dip in, uh, I mean, boil it and make, uh, take it out a solution, dip the yarn in that solution, take it out, you will get a, a different kind of uh, color. But after a few months, then it will start to shape the color, uh, even if you wash or even if you keep uh, dry them in the sun. So those uh, materials which I, I have uh, shown in this video and which are there in my book are the material, uh, raw materials which I have already done uh, the research by myself as well as my father in 70s. And they, they never shed their color even if we keep it for 20 to 30 years. As I have shown in the video footage about the needle plant, and the, uh, that uh, the color which I have added uh, in that needle uh, during the weaving are 20 years uh, done the dying before 20 years, and still the color remains same. That's amazing. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Great question. Let's go to Isabella. Isabella. Love to hear your question. Isabella? Um, do you use any, um, can you hear me? Yeah, yeah, I can hear you. Yeah, yeah, thank you. Do you use any um, metal mordants like, um, and we here in the West, we use alum and iron and copper? No, I don't no. use. No. And actually, I'm not using it because I'm doing it everything as an organic, which I get from the forest, forest itself. And uh, I too have allergic with that uh, metallic uh, modern yeah. so okay. that I don't. And are you using just a protein fiber, just wools, or are you using some cotton? Yeah, cotton also I'm using, but the dyeing process. It's same, but the timing is quite different. Uh, example, if you do it on silk, it takes two hours. So if you take uh, cotton, it takes uh, three to four hours. And if you take wool, it takes one night, which means almost 12 hours. Yeah, yeah. Thank you very much. That's really interesting. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you. so much for your question. Shoshana, we'd love to hear your question. Thank you. Thank you. I'm wondering about the uh, quantities of uh, of water and the, the dyeing material for the uh, uh, for the thread. How do you know how much to take of each? So you so you get the uh, the proper color you're expecting. So I'll take example of leg itself. Since uh, the talk was more about the leg, I'll take the example. So here, when I do my dyeing work, I do in kilo kg system. So at one go, I'm doing uh, two to three kgs at the time. I'm not doing a hang system. So yarn also I'm keeping as a silk only. So one kg of silk, we need to have uh, four kgs of uh, lac. One kilo of uh, yarn, four kgs of lag, and 30 liters of water. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. While we are waiting for the next question is from Tatiana, I wanted to ask you, 
to uh, please talk about the kind of tours we're looking for, uh, forward to organizing to come visit your studio, that we're going to welcome people into your garden and your studio, and they can spend time with you seeing your traditional processes. And so we're organizing these tours um, and um, anyone that's interested that's here or watching this in video replay, please contact us to join one of our tours to Bhutan to visit our Master Dyer studio and garden. Kensho, do you have anything to say about that? Yeah, so in that uh, as a short footage, I couldn't give the entire process of uh, dyeing. Once I thought to give the entire dyeing process, but uh, due to the time, uh, because uh, to dye one color, it takes uh, around one full day. So because of that, I couldn't show it. And in future, if you are interested to visit uh, and or if you are interested to learn how the organic materials, raw materials are extracted, how they are har harvested and how the moderns are uh, collected and how the processes are uh, done here in my workshop. So you are most welcome to visit um, Anne, Anne and myself. We will arrange the task, uh, the thing, or transportation and everything. So I'm much more interested to share the ideas, uh, teach. Rather, I'm also a learner only. I cannot say I'll teach. Then we will just discuss it together in my workshop, and then uh, we will learn how to how. I had been doing this uh, the dining and all in Bhutan for the last 23 years. Yes, I'd like to add that I've had the opportunity to document Kencho's dyeing process, and it's truly amazing. It's done on wood-fired stove, and uh, you become part of the process yourself. I really invite everyone to join in this opportunity. Thank you. Now. Let's go to the next question. Tatiana. Hello, Tatiana. I'm glad you could join. Um, please ask your question of Kencho. Sure. I'm glad I was able to attend too. This has been wonderful. Um, my question is, have you ever, uh, are you looking, have you tried or are you considering perhaps experimenting with dyeing paper pulp? I've, uh, I'm, this is just an assumption on my part but cotton-based, uh, cotton pulp, uh, I'm assuming that would process somewhat similarly to cotton fabrics. I, I was just curious about that. Uh, sorry, I didn't get you uh, fully, but uh, you mean on paper or on cotton? Sorry, I meant, have you ever tried dyeing paper, like the pulp, uh, like, that you use to make paper oftentimes uh, is made is from like is uh, from processed cotton fabrics or linen fabrics. So I was wondering if one you had ever tried dyeing pulp for making paper or the actual finished paper product, and if so, is it similar uh, dyeing times or proportions of water to dye as if, uh, as you would have with actual cotton fabrics. Sorry. Uh, cotton, uh, so I, I don't have that much idea how the cotton is, uh, yarns, they are made. And uh, whereas silk, it is directly extracted from cocoon and then uh, the a cultivator, they just make a roll and they just bind up and then they just send it here. And then how I import it from India. Actually, I'm importing from India only, but uh, all entire yarns, uh, silk, cotton, or raw silk. Yeah, it, and different thing, uh, there is another name. I don't know what we call in scientific and all, but uh, we call it out here in Bhutan, we call it telecotton. So that's the difference between the silk and the cotton. And uh, by looking through our naked eyes, uh, we can see, see that uh, the silk yarn seems to be very uh, thin, uh, light and a bit uh, smaller in size. Whereas uh, cotton and all, they are a bit 
bigger in size, maybe because of that, that they consume more time than the silk yarn. Mm, very cool, thank you. Thank you. All right. Birgit, please ask your question. Hello, that is Birgit from Amsterdam. And, and, and Kenju, I would love to say thank you so much for sharing this interesting video with us and for letting us go into your business, into your experience, letting share Kenjo your experience with us. This is very valuable. I'm really touched and I'm, I want to thank you very much for that. And I have two questions. Yeah. My first question is, you talked, you, you would um, dye the yarn and not the fabric. Huh? As far as I understand you, you rather dye the yarn and then the women are spinning it. Huh? Yes. Okay. And my second question regards the indigo. Uh, is there still some indigo in Bhutan? Um, and and I'm, I'm really impressed that there are still farmers to um, grow it and to do all the effort to get the indigo um, growing and, and harvesting. Um, and my question is, can we support you and the indigo dyers and how could we support you? Thank you very much uh, for your feedback. And uh, uh, indigo, it's cultivated here in Bhutan. Uh, as earlier, I told you that uh, Bhutan has, is divided into four uh, zones, uh, southern, northern, eastern and western. Uh, in West, especially the place where I stay is the capital of Bhutan and uh, the plantation and the uh, villager, those who are growing indigo, it's in Eastern Bhutan. And uh, I, have, um, I have, I gave a try to grow indigo here in Thimpu. It doesn't, there's a climatic condition, doesn't suit to, to grow indigo here. So even I have, uh, gave a try in a greenhouse also, but it doesn't. But especially in Eastern Bhutan, the state we the state name known as uh, Mongar and there is again a sub uh, state that saying Chaska there it grows and uh, the reason behind for people to cultivate the, this uh, indigo is that uh, annually we Bhutanese in our uh, culture we perform a ritual every year in that ritual uh, and one uh, substances has to be kept in the central while performing the ritual is the indigo plant. For that reason, the indigo is planted there. Interesting. And yes. That's how the indigo cultivation is done. And now due to the modernization and development and all, they just divert their uh, thing, uh, in, uh, concentration instead of uh, cultivating, they tend to buy from India or from different places. And they're giving up those uh, cultivation and harvesting of indigo. For that reason only, I have uh, uh, encouraged people by providing uh, money, by giving support from my side. Until now, I have been doing in this way. Thank you so much, and and I'm I'm uh, yeah I will try to help. We will discuss with Anne how we can set up something to help and to provide yeah some help to to grow the indigo in Bhutan. Yeah. So thank, thank you very much. much. Thank you so much. Appetit. Hello. Hello. Yeah. First of all, I would like to congratulate you for this wonderful talk, uh, Mr. Ken Shodeka. It's really uh, so beautiful to see that how uh, this uh, dying process or and all the details that you have told us. Uh, I'm very much interested in your book 
And I would like to know that how one can get your book, how one can purchase it. Is it going to be available online? And I have a question also about Indigo, because I heard that Indigo has some medicinal uh, values also. It keeps insects away, like mosquitoes and other uh, small insects. Uh, and one you know, of the expert once said to me that this is one of the reason that uh, this is dye particularly is used in tankas. So uh, I would like to know your views about it also. Thank you. And thank you very much for your question. And straight away, I'm so sorry that uh, I don't know whether it is used for a medical medicine or not. I'm not sure about it. <clears throat> but uh, dying with indigo, it provides only blue and green color. Blue and green. In case if you die with indigo and if you get, uh, if you catch up some different color, that means the process which you have chosen or the uh, the process is completely wrong. You have made a, you have made a mistake in the process. Or else you have made a mistake in the fermentation process. Uh, indigo, it's a plant. Uh, you cannot uh, just directly pluck it uh, from the area where it grows and ju just uh, start to die. Uh, for that, you, uh, you have to wait for years and years to get fermented. And uh, the fermentation process uh, itself is very long, but I'll summarize and see. Once the indigo plant, the uh, leaves are all extracted, then they are dried up in the sun brought it, uh, bring it to a place where you can pound it, make a ball form and get an earthen pot, uh, get the tap water, uh, boil it uh, till it reaches around 60 to 70 degrees centigrade. Uh, let them cool it, just uh, put it in the earthen pot. Then no matter uh, about the liters, how much liters and all, it, it will depend upon the pot you're using, I mean the earthen pot. Just add the water there, and on top of that, add uh, as much as you like, as much as you have the indigo ball. Just put it there, uh, put the lid, cover up the lid with the help of mud, so the air won't come out from the pot. So after a week or two, again, then get back to go back to the forest. You collect the bamboo or the oak leaf, dry up, burn it, make it ash. And then open up again, open up that the earthen pot which you have posed earlier after a week or two. Then add that uh, lime, add that, uh, add that uh, dust which you have burned the uh, thing, uh, what? bamboo and all the oak leaf. Just add it there. Again, put it and then keep it for months or two, as much as long as you need to make some blue color. That's how I had been doing. And regarding the book, uh, so at present, since I'm in Bhutan, I haven't uh, sent it anywhere and I haven't given to anyone. So if you are interested, uh, if you are in need, uh, I do have a uh, thing on is there. And uh, if you want to connect directly with me, uh, I am using WhatsApp, Telegram, uh, Facebook, and everything. So you can just type my name, find it out. Uh, you will find my name there. You can add me. So I'll just contact with you, and I'll, we will sort it out how to send it. Thank you so Thank much. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Now, uh, for those of you that are joining late and those who, um, due to technical difficulties, missed part of the presentation, we promise you uh, an entire video of this uh, wonderful presentation by Master Dyer, Kencho Dekar. And so uh, please feel free, if you just joined, due to technical difficulties, to ask your question. 
and pretty soon we'll be sending you the entire video. Thank you so much. Sorry about the technical difficulties. Now we have another question from Aishwarya. Aishwarya, please unmute and ask your question. Firstly, thank you so very much for such an engaging session. And my question is that uh, how do you plan to pass down your knowledge, which is the sacred art of dying to your students and your next generation family members? First thing, it depends upon the interest of uh, the other uh, people. So I have written everything and I have given, not only written, I have given in the book, the detail, what kind of raw materials I had been using in past years and also in present year. So in that, I have given the two most expensive and important the process. I mean, the indigo dyeing and the lag dyeing. Step by step, I have given it with the pictorial form. So beneath the picture, I have given the narration. Uh, I, have given, I have written it saying that this much time you have to keep it there, this much at this temperature you have to uh, uh, filter it, and at this time you have to dip your yarns and all. So I have given everything detailed in the book. So since here in Bhutan, I can now I think I'm a bit, I have a bit hope that at least I have uh, passed my idea to a certain, maybe for 10 to 15 percent here in Bhutan, because uh, the Prime Minister of Bhutan uh, asked me to distribute in the schools, in the we uh, in the entire schools in the Bhutan, and I have distributed it. And hopefully, out of thousand, maybe around hundred will show their interest and work on it. So that's how I'm planning to keep this for next generation. Thank you so much. Thank you. We have time for one more question, Shoshana. Yes, what's yeah. your yes, thank you. Thank you very much for your uh, presentation, inspiring very much. I have a question regarding other dyers and weavers. Uh, are you connected in some way or do you meet? Do you have, uh, uh, do you work together or not? <laughs> Thank you very much. Uh, actually, no, I'm doing my own and I'm following the process which my father taught me and which I saw what my father did in past years. Uh, I mean, in yeah, I started to do this uh, dying work from 1990. <laughs> and my father, he started from 1970. So, I had been following his process and I'm con doing continuously with his process only. Yeah, no, I, I never meet or I never do work with other dyer because they might have their own process, they might have their own ideas and all. Shoshana? Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Lisa, you have a question for a master dyer. Lisa. A very heartfelt thank you for sharing this with us. I'm curious, um, is Indigo the only source of blue or has woad ever been used in Bhutan? I know it was used in China, but I don't know if the woad plant has been part of the blue palette. Thank you very much for the question. I couldn't hear your question fully, but uh... How much I hear, I heard, and how much I understood from your question. So I'll try to do, I'll try to give you the answer. Actually, I don't know about uh, the in other countries and all how indigo uh, they started to die. Whereas in 
done, especially I told you that uh, the I I'll talk with the uh, cultivating because uh, in Eastern Bhutan, especially the state uh, we call it Mungar, there they perform a ritual every year, once a year. So during that time, the, this uh, indigo is used as a main source of uh, material for that ritual itself. And for that reason, it is uh, it is cultivated there. And I don't know the varieties. I, I know there will be many varieties of uh, indigo plants. Uh, say in India, it has different varieties. In other, so for example, in China, it might be with different varieties. But here in Bhutan, uh, in before seventies, before seventies, before my father he started to do this uh, dying work in East, I am not sure, and he he was also not he's also not sure, and uh, and the idea how he got the dye with the indigo was he was sent to India uh, to study handloom technology by the government of Bhutan, and uh, he studied in, he studied in India in southern South India, which is in Madras. He studied in Indian Institute of Handloom Technology, where he was taught the chemical dyeing process of uh, thing yarn. So later, when he came back to Bhutan, and then he started to do the dyeing work. So maybe uh, he was taught there how indigo gives the blue color. And later, uh, maybe he knew that the blue color will be provided by indigo leaves only, not by any other. So in case if you apply Kesab chemicals and all, then of course it will provide the blue color. But he brought the no idea of chemical dye from India and the, the idea of that chemical dye was replaced by the organic materials. So from there only the blue color uh, was started here in Bhutan. But uh, I'm so sorry to see that I don't know about uh, other countries, how they started, when they started the thing. But here in Bhutan, it was started in 70s and 80s. And I did this indigo dying maybe in around 1999 when I was in 10th standard. Because in the, to die with indigo, it takes long process and uh, we, need, we, should, uh, we need to have some, uh, and maybe around 100 kilos of patients to dye blue color out of indigo. And the, the process and entire work is so uh, interesting that we never, never felt boring board or something like that while uh, do, uh, doing dying process with indigo and with other plants also. Thank you. Thank you for your insightful questions. And we promised to send you the video recording of the entire Zoom. We look forward to receiving your further questions and please consider joining us in Bhutan to visit Kencho's home, garden, and studio. We welcome you to the next In Our At Home series of treasure caretaker training videos and Zoom. Thank you so much for joining us today and bye for now. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.